you know, music changes so fast that like mm -hmm. it, 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 you know what I mean? And it's such a weird environment for getting music. Like it's like so much different than when I was a kid or like. Hey, what's up, Paul? How are you? Great, man. How are you? I'm doing well. I appreciate you doing this. No worries. Thanks for having me. It's, no, it's, it's, it's no, thank you so much. And thank you so much for being flexible on the time. Uh, I didn't realize that my son has uh, his physical doctor's appointment today. At, oh, uh, so I was like, it would have been cutting it real close since I have to get him at school <laughs> early. Dude, I totally get it. I totally get it. So thank you. Um, how old your, how's your son? I'm sorry? How old is your son? Six. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he's got like, a, I think it's just like one of the typical... Um, yeah, physicals or whatever. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. <laughs> I did see you have a couple kids. Is that what I read? Yeah, I have twin boys. They're not really kids anymore. They're sixteen, so they're driving around and oh wow, doing doing, doing more manly stuff than kids stuff nowadays. But it's 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 fun. That's cool. Are they identical twins? No, they're fraternal. Okay. Uh, they're they're. It's funny, dude, because they're like uh, they're about as opposite as you get. It's weird. Really? It's really weird. Yeah. It's like they could be, if I wasn't there when it happened, I would think that they, one of them got switched. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I feel like that my neighbor across the street has a similar, he's has twin daughters that are like 100% opposite of each other. Yeah. It's crazy, man. You just never yeah. know what you're going to get. It's, it's a, uh, but, but it's great because, you know, they complement each other quite well. And the important thing is that they look after each other. And I, I have a brother who's three years younger than me um, and we're, we're, we are much more similar than my sons are to each other, to each other. But like, I can't imagine having a compadre your whole life. that's exactly the same age that goes to the same shit as you all the time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the shit that you, like I know a totally unique experience. I know I have one sibling, my sister, my sister, but she's 11 years younger than I am. So it's like, oh, wow. yeah, she doesn't even remember like me living at the house. Right. Yeah, right. so it's t totally different uh, upbringings, but <laughs> I, have, I have twin sisters that are six years younger than me, and oh, wow. and like we talk and we're we're related. You know what I mean? Like we we right. grew up together, but you just don't have that much in common, especially when it's a girl. And if it's over X amount of mm -hmm. years, it's like there's such different vibes going on that like right? No, you know? completely, completely. Yeah, it's I uh, they came, we recently moved to Nashville from San Diego. Uh, well, it's, I guess it's been like a year and a half now. Um, but when she came out with her now husband, like it just like listening to them talk about you know music or whatever, like I just felt like, oh my gosh, like I'm so like what I grew up and related to was is so much further ahead of what Funny. they were doing. You know what I mean? Like they like like '90s bands. Like they're, you know, like almost like in some, like, it'd be like me finding like the Pesh Mode and those type of bands. It's like, yeah. it's just so weird to hear how they, you know what I mean? It's just so different. Yeah, dude. Like it's, especially nowadays because, you know, music changes so fast that like mm -hmm. it, 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 you know what I mean? And it's such a weird environment for getting music like it's like so much different than when I was a kid or like, you know, your, your, your form of years for like listening to music are much younger than people like to admit you know what i mean it's like, it like right. it's from 10 to like 17 or 10 to 15 or some shit like that where it's like you're most open to like finding new things and when you that's the basement of your house for the rest of your life pretty much you know what i mean no that's so wild to think about that right yeah, yeah. like those but, early early bands that you grab onto like like for me it was green day and yeah. Blink-182 was from my town. So like I, when, before they were the 182, they were just Blink and they were like grew up in our area and like yeah. having those early, seeing them early on in those early shows to seeing where they're at now, where like they're spent, you know, people are spending 900 bucks to see them. Yeah. To me, it's just like, un, un, like unreal. Like it, it's just yeah. so weird. <laughs> yeah, it's totally, totally. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a wild yeah it's a wild climate like you never know you know what i mean like i went to see i went to see limp biscuit at um at Lollapalooza was fucking crazy like two years uh -huh. ago or whatever it was like i guess it was two years ago it was like journey 
was like playing like after <laughs> the biscuit and then after journey it was like post malone you know what i mean it was like yeah it was just like this wild and like but like i went to see fred durst and i've become friends over you know the last 15 years and he you know i'm from chicago like so i i, I went up there because i went up there because my then 14 or 15 year old kid was like i want to see journey and i was like what <laughs> And like, every, you know, so every year I get like artist passes, you know, then like the last couple right. of years, I just haven't gone because like I'm doing other shit or I'm running around or whatever. But this year I was like, I'm, I got artist passes. You guys want to go? One of them was like, nah, I'm good. The other one was like, I want to go see Journey. So I was like, okay, do you mind if we go a little early? So let's check out my friend Fred, his band. And, and he had never heard of Limp Bizkit, but we went and we watched and I was astounded, A, astounded that people were as hype for Limp Bizkit at Lollapalooza in 2021 as they were at like Woodstock 1999. You know what I mean? It was, it right. was hype. Yeah. People were getting hype. <laughs> and, and That's Fred so like wild. A, Fred was in a blonde wig with like a, a mustache and like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like, like old man pants on and like doing his thing. And then, and then after that, we watched Journey and Journey was absolutely shit packed as well. Like it was, it was crazy that because all these kids are discovering, you know, in the absence of one thing, something else always presents itself, right? So if you flood uh -huh. the market with a bunch of horse shit, it just makes the things that are great stand out more. Does that make sense? Like, right. No, yeah. that totally makes sense. Yeah, I heard so like, some statistic like 44, I think it's 44,000 songs are uploaded on Spotify, new songs every day. Yeah, dude. There's more songs that's, uploaded in a day than like we released in a year, like fucking 20 years ago. You know what I mean? That's like, so, so like, crazy. Yeah. And so, so what's nuts is, you know, it all traces back and to, to stop me whenever we're, we're on bullshitting, but like it all traces. No, this is amazing. Like <laughs> the way people consume things and it doesn't have anything to do with the art. It has to do with commerce. Right. So like mm -hmm. when, when we switch the way we're delivering the mechanism for delivery has impacted the mechanism for delivery has always impacted more than the product itself right so it's mm -hmm. like when people when people first started listening to music on the radio versus going to a big band hall and hearing it it was like fuck this radio you know what i mean people right, are like, right. like, we're not gonna go watch the guys down there and like you're not gonna go pay these dudes and they're like well we're paying the musicians to play on the radio and just more people can hear it and people were like that bullshit and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they started recording it and then playing it and then people were like oh my you know when d when they started putting djs on the radio did you know that the united states Mis musicians union went on strike for two years no two i didn't years. know that yeah go yeah oh google my it god so, I should so, know that I, I grew I did radio for almost 20 years. Yeah. But this is back like, in the, this is back in the forties. <laughs> like back at, back, back still in the like that's wild. Yeah. So like, because they used to, the way music used to be broadcast on the radio is there'd be like a big band hall and all the guys would come in and play their instruments and people play over the radio and they get around that little wood thing with the golden knobs and listen mm -hmm. to it, <laughs> whatever the transistor radio or whatever. And like that, then, but then they were like, Oh man, we can record this. And we don't got to bring all these dudes in all the time and give them coffee and donuts. They can just, we can record it once and then have a DJ play it. People were up in arms. It was the end of music. You know what I mean? So it's like every right. single time, like a new technology comes around and, and there's going to be 15 more of them by the time you or I are dead. You know what I mean? Like it's going right. to deliver, know, the delivery to system will change 20 more times. But what I'm saying is whenever that happens, there's an uproar or a change and like the change over the years like was like okay now we don't have to listen to 30 minutes of music at a time we can listen to 15 minutes of music and then somebody will tell me to go to the hardware store down the street and buy a fucking hammer and then i go back to the mm -hmm. music again and blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. That, Buy now, a used car. Like, yeah yeah exactly now it's like now it's like it's changed from radio went to mini disc to cds to vinyl to cassettes all these different mechanisms and now what we're doing is is that we're quantifying what a song is based on how much money we can make off of it. So it's like if people only motherfuckers are making songs that are a minute and a half long, because that's exactly the qualifying amount that it costs for a song so that they can get their 0.0001 cent for every play. 
that you oh, rather is that the number? Just, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, those aren't the exact numbers, but that's okay. I was just, good. I thought they were doing it just because of like the TikTok and like real links. Again, you know what I mean? Like they can they only all, be a minute or a minute all, and a half all, or whatever. They all feed off of each other, but the that's, minute, oh, the minute wow. for TikTok or the 15 seconds for this or the 30 seconds that you can play it before. They need to play you 30 seconds so you know what the song is, but they can't award it as a play because they don't want to pay you for it. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, that makes a so lot then, of sense. So then the, then, the, then the system deciding on who, how to get paid like is, is saying like, okay, cool. You are we're going to lift you have this 30 seconds, but we're not going to pay the artist for the 30 seconds that you're listening to. But if you listen to it for 31 seconds, we're going to pay the artist. We have to pay the artist X amount of dollars. But if it's under a minute and 30, that if it goes over a minute and 30, that's great. But oh, if it's not, the actual real song is not over a minute and 30. We don't have to pay anybody. It doesn't count as a song. So it's like, it's like all these different rules and regulations. I mean, if you look at it, like, the songwriters union and and the government and spotify and bmi and all these people that get paid off music they're fighting all the time in in Mm -hmm. congress and like just to find out what actually constitutes a song but as an artist you know human beings are naturally a lot of times you know want to do the bare minimum and it makes sense like if i make a song that's four and a half minutes long and i only get paid once for it why wouldn't i make three songs and get paid three times if they're all a minute and a half right 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 i get paid three times right so it's like people are reducing the length of songs from like in the 70s when you get a song like Freebird and it's yeah, it's like nine long. minutes yeah right exactly <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an hour and a half opus and then it, because it's artistic so now it's like yo let me make this one minute and 31 seconds long so every time somebody pushes play on spotify i get paid and if they listen to the whole minute and 30 seconds they have to rewind to listen to it again to get their fill oh yeah i got two plays instead of three plays instead of one you know right right the new mechanism the new mechanism and the ever-changing mechanism is is like really dictating people's artistic endeavors i think a lot and it and whether you realize it it's a moving animal right it grows and changes with time so it's like if if every good song that that people are considering good or like putting up or or reposting or putting on TikTok is only a minute and 30 seconds long, then the next group of people that, that are trying to make a song, the kid that just went from 15 to 18 and now is able to create a song that's viable is just going to make a minute and 30 because he thinks that that's a standard, right? Mm-hmm. He's not going to go out right. and try to make a nine minute song because that would be ridiculous. It'd be like out of, right. it's out of your And everything he's been consuming has been a minute 30, right? right? And then it's like, yeah. wait, would somebody put out a nine minute song? That's insane. Like what? Right. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. But well, what, yeah, I'm I mean, is, what I'm saying is, and back to the original point is if you make a hundred Roddy Rich songs, I'm not shitting on Roddy Rich. I think Roddy Rich is dope. But, but mm-hmm. what I'm saying is if there's a thousand artists that are all making songs that sound like Roddy Rich, the one time you run across journey, you're going to be like, holy shit, what is this? Do you, know, do you understand right. what I'm saying? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you, when, you, when people say, holy shit, what is this? Everybody says, holy shit, what is this? But they're incapable of making it because they weren't trained that way because they weren't consuming it. So now it, it rotates in a big cycle. All music is cyclical. All music is cyclical. So like right after, I mean, you'll probably notice this now, a lot of bands and a lot of acts are looking at the Blink-182s and the Green Days to influence them in music. It's happening again. Bands are starting to reform like new music. Oh, yeah. Follow people that are like, I'm punk rocking it out. It's But it, the great thing about it is it's like wildly multicultural. When I was a kid, it was like one fish bone and one living color. Now it's like this complete multicultural landscape of punk rock fucking rebel motherfuckers that like want to make music because they're drawing from all these other sources, which I think is you got to look at the good and the bad of everything for every dumb TikTok song about somebody's dick that goes completely <laughs> viral on the, you know what I mean? On, on right, right. Whatever the charts, there's somebody out there writing a great song about their feelings in their life. You know what I mean? In response to that, that you know, so you got to, yeah, yeah it's, it's really wild to think. Cause like, if you like, you know, uh, Jack Harlow, he, he's pulling back a song, like a Fergie song or a black eyed peas song, which to me is like, not very old. Right. Yeah. I'm like, Whoa. Like, and like i have a 14 year old son as well so he's like 
singing along and i'm like not in the like he was getting it off tiktok before it became a hit or it was becoming yeah. a hit and i'm like i was like what is like fergie a big hit on like tiktok right now and he's like what are you talking about and i'm like you're singing and you no know, black eyed peace song he's like no it's jack harlow and i'm like wait what and then i heard it i'm like oh like it's just weird to see that even happening i'm like god yeah. i feel old yeah. <laughs> like, yeah and you know what that cycle is getting slower and slower too which is crazy because th this this is gonna sound totally insane but last night we went to i went to dinner with my kids and they were coming we were coming back my son was driving and he was going they were my, one of my sons loves Coldplay and the other one loves The Weeknd. You know what I mean? Okay, sure. And one of them loves Lionel Richie and the other one loves Mumford and Sons. You know what I mean? One of them's very much R&B, like kind of like soul driven. And the other one's very um, like, you know, band uh, musicianship, like guitar driven. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? And, and they both like each other's stuff, but like if you're picking them out one or the other. So, so they take turns listening to songs. They take turns battling in the front seat, like whose song is what, right? And like one of them was playing this Coldplay song that he liked. And I don't remember which one it was at the time. And the other one started playing this weekend song that he liked. And 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 they were arguing about the merits of each song. And when my son played the weekend song, I was like, fuck, I know this song. What is this song from? And and then the lyrics of the song popped into my head, but the because I knew the melody, but I, I I knew the lyrics, but I couldn't remember who sung it. So I Googled the lyrics and it was a fucking R. Kelly song. The weekend. Oh my gosh. Took Feeling on Your Booty by R. Kelly and made it into a, a weekend, a, a song by the weekend. And then I looked it up and he actually had to give R. Kelly credits. I don't know when the song. Credit was. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the exact same melody. Yeah. But I, was like, I was like, that song is not even that old. It's like 10 years old. It's like not even. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's, it's wild that people are taking something 10 years ago, but because people have such short-term memories now, they don't even remember what was going on. <laughs> yeah, that it happened, right? <laughs> yeah, because in the beginning, it was like, you know, Notorious B.I.G. was doing it with, like, uh, Juicy Fruit, right? He took it. Yeah. And, but it was like, that was so old. And, like, so, yeah, it was like it, the, the, the gap in between yeah. the two songs was so massive that you wouldn't even really know unless you were a funk fan, right? Yeah. And, and then now it's, like, so close. It's like, you know, like you just said, The weekend taking an R. Kelly song or even – uh camila cabello had that one song that she took that i think it was an abba song that she basically yeah. just ripped off the whole uh chorus yeah <laughs> and it's like <laughs> and then the magic for that for the artist what's funny about that if you if you if you look at it is like an artist if you're camila cabello right you have songwriters are coming in helping you write the lyrics you're having uh the producer come in and musicians come in to help you read work whatever the song is and do all that work right and at the end of the day you put the song out and let's just say i don't i'm not familiar with the camilla cabello abba what the songs they actually are but let's just say that camilla cabello took an abba song everybody on that song that gets paid for making the song get paid nothing you get paid like such a minimum amount the producer gets it's paid in advance for like the actual work on the production and the points on the song but the, all the publishing nine times out of ten goes directly to abba so like most most oh, you know, okay so like for instance i made a i took a cool in the gang record i think it was like get down on it or something and i and i reinterpolated it and and like i don't sample a lot like i sometimes i'll take a song and and like try and make something else out of it or whatever especially songs that i like and i was experimenting with this is probably like three or four years ago i was experimenting with this idea like let me take before disco really like kind of started popping off again and I was like, oh, let me take this and do it and blah, blah, blah. And I really liked the song. And I really liked what the artist did on top of the song. And we sent it to like the publishing company for Cooling Day. And they were like, yeah, they want 95%. And I was like, why would I even, why would I even put the song out? It, it would have yeah. to sell, it would have to sell 15 billion copies for me to make more money than I would work at McDonald's. You know what I mean? All the money goes straight to cool in the gang, right? So it's like, it's like, I guess back to it being cyclical, that's why a lot of these people. I don't know if you notice in the industry, but a lot of companies are going and buying back catalogs. You read in the paper like, oh, these guys oh, just yeah, bought yeah. Bruce Springsteen's catalog. They just bought sure. all Bob Marley's catalog because there's a monster force of corporate America that owns all this real estate for old songs. And they go out and they try and push new artists to use old songs to make new songs so that the songs that they own 
you know, increase in value and they get paid oh, off. Oh, so like if somebody, if you went and bought, yeah, Bruce Springsteen, for example, the back, his back catalog, and then some new artists, they'd pitch it like, oh, this is a cool little hook, or you could take this little melody and, and write something new off of it. Then that person that just bought all the masters or whatever it is to that, or the publishing rights to that song will just collect if that becomes a hit again. Yeah, I'll collect a lot. Of money. <laughs> oh, wow. A lot of money. And God forbid, here's where it gets real fucking gross. God forbid you do it on accident, right? Like you do oh. it on accident where it's like, oh, I wrote this song. I'm Ed Sheeran. I wrote this song. And you take it out and you put it out and it's out for two years. And then all of a sudden, the estate of some dead artist that owns the rights to the song says, look at this, this chord progression. You took this chord progression. You're like, I never even heard this song in my life. And they're like, no, this is a famous song. You took the chord progression. And you're like, I didn't. And right. Like, yes, you did. And then you go in front of 12 dumb fucks that say, oh, these songs sound <laughs> a lot alike. And then the, the judge is like, you know what? You got to pay this guy. And then all the hard work that you put into the, the song ends up going to some estate from some catalog where the actual artist would be disgusted that you were chasing this money around like a corporate dick. But like that, that's like commonplace now. You put right. out and some you know, Christian rapper from 1985 says, you know, I, I said something about Holy Ghost on my on this rap that I made. And now I'm going to take you to court about it. And it's like it's it's a nightmare. Like this landscape is an actual nightmare right now because they haven't figured it out. Well, there's just so many songs. Right. I mean, there's so many songs and there's so much stuff that you because you, you could take a, a I mean, at what point do they start copywriting chord progressions? You know what well, I mean? the thing about it is it's got to be like a combination of three things, right? Like okay. It's got to be a combination of like two or three things, I guess. And listen, I'm not, I'm not legally, I've been sued like five times and I've never lost, <laughs> but, but, but like, that's completely like arbitrary. I, I could have lost if the wrong, you know what I mean? But like, I know yeah. I didn't take anything, but like, I've had people call, I've had, I had somebody sit me down one time and be like, this lawsuit is here. Oh my God. It just happened a lot. I just put out a pit bull record. I put on a Pitbull record and this fucking leech from uh, that I talked to 12 years ago, this <laughs> kid that emailed me and said, Hey man, I have this song. I think it would be great for, for one of the artists you work for. And, and to be tr honest with you, song was a cool song, but it was a dance. Like it was completely uninterpolatable. You know what I mean? Right, like it was, right, right. There was nothing you could make out of it. It existed. It's kind of like, um, it, it, it's like one of those one note songs you know what i mean like where it's like it just goes bam 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 you know what i mean like that and it's like, right 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 there's no melody to it there's nothing and so when i heard it i was like and me being me i'm like oh it's a great song you know maybe we can work together in the future take care yeah. you know good luck right. on your journey i'm really proud of you and like that's how i talk to people right so i, I sure on you 12 years ago this happened and so so all of a sudden i make this song and, and I get an email from some ambulance chase and dickhead who's like, oh, my client talked to you 12 years ago and he thinks that you took this song from him because it's got a horn in it. And I'm like, uh, it, <laughs> what? what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What? what the hell are you talking about? And so for like six months, I'm like totally getting harassed by this dude. Like, we're going to take you to court. We want all this stuff. Like, so like I'm listening to the song come out and like have a good reception and like good fun and the whole mm -hmm. thing is completely undermined and marred by some ambulance chasing asshole that like is like trying to get paid off something that i did because i had one email interaction with some dude 12 years ago you know what right I mean? yeah, yeah yeah i can't it's even yeah because they're gonna be yeah he's thinking he's just gonna cash in or you're gonna be yeah. like all right dude here's x amount of money and just yeah. go away yeah but like that, but like you do that once and then every butthole that you've talked to in the last 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. So like what, what's the sad thing about it is, is that I'm the type of person that like wants to give people advice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I believe truly wholeheartedly in mentorship and advice, right? Like, so when people, kids call me and like, Hey man, what do you think of my, I've been writing this song for 12, 12 months and I really want some advice. Is it good? Is it bad? What can I do with it? Where does it fit? Like, blah, blah, blah. What do you think I should do? I don't give a shit how bad your song is. I can give you advice. Like I want right. to give you advice. I want to, even if the advice is 
don't quit your day job. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> which, which I would which put I, that I in the <laughs> trash can on your computer. No, but, no, but I, I wouldn't, but I'd be like, you know, you, maybe, maybe you could work on the lyrics. Maybe you could collaborate with somebody who's better at bass than this, or, you know, whatever I could give. Yeah. Yeah. But I've been cornered into this corner where like people send me songs on the internet and I so badly want to be like, Oh my God, this is great. Or, oh my God, it's bad. But I can't even listen to the fucking songs. Because I don't, I like t- uh, five years from now, I, I make something with somebody, and then this person says, oh, "I DM'd you five years ago, and you listened to my song." Like I can't even open it. As soon as somebody sends me a song on the internet now, I just delete it. Yeah, that's I, I smart. Delete it. Yeah. I delete the whole thing, which is like such a disservice to the community of artists that I've signed up to join. I didn't join this thing because I wanted to be a lawyer. I fucking hate lawyers. Right. The worst people on earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, now I got to watch. It's like, it's like, if it's like, if you wanted to go work at a soup kitchen every weekend to help, you know what I mean? To help the community. And the whole time you were on uh-huh. your way to soup kitchen, like a cop was pulling you over every 15 minutes down the highway. You know what I mean? Like you were like, I'm not going to that soup kitchen anymore to help anybody. Cause I've been pulled over. I got $150 worth of tickets on my way to go do a service for people. You see what I'm saying? Sure. It ruins no, your mind. No, no, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Because at that point, you're like, well, if I start, right, you're automatically going to, if I even respond to this, or I even mention anything, if some down somewhere down the line, this person still hasn't made it, they're going to go try to dig for something that I've done and been like, oh, see, that kind of sounds a little bit like what I did here. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I had That's a girl wild. sue me one time because I had her boyfriend play bass on a song. I don't play the bass guitar. Okay. I wish I did. It's a very sexy instrument. I I find people very, uh, very handsome that are playing the bass. I think it's a good instrument, right? <laughs> but I don't, I've never done it, right? I've never played the bass. So like I hired a dude, you know, to play the bass guitar, actually bring in a guitar, play the bass. Uh-huh. And, and, and two years after the song comes out, <laughs> without going into super detail, I had his ex-girlfriend hit me and say, well, my boyfriend played bass for you and I wrote this song three years ago and you have a song named this and they're similar concepts. So I got to believe that I told my ex-boyfriend about this song. He, while he was in there playing bass for you in the studio, you and him talked about my song. And then three years later, you went and wrote a song that had a similar concept to this song that I wrote. I was like, I don't even know who the fuck you are. I have no <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's like, do you know how many songs have the same name? Yeah, exactly. like the most unbelievable thing I, I've ever heard. I didn't know you existed. I don't know that you were on the play. I don't know anything about you. He didn't mention you, I'm assuming, because you're his ex-girlfriend and didn't give a shit about you either. But like whatever. right. So anyway, I had to go to a deposition for like three days in a row. I spent let dig this, bro. I spent a hundred and sixty thousand dollars fighting this case. Oh, I was just going to say that it's got to cost you so much money to go through this bullshit all the time. It's crazy. And then what happened is, is that we won. The judge demanded that she pay back our legal costs because it was such a frivolous suit. And we wasted so much money on going back and forth. The judge was like, this is stupid. You're stupid. Pay this kid back his money. And so when I, when we went to go get the money, her lawyer said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're either going to appeal this and make you spend another $160,000 fighting it, or you can drop it. But after you fight it, if we lose a second time in the appeal, she's going to declare bankruptcy and you're going to get no money back. So you can either just take the loss on the 160 or you can double that and then take the loss on the 320. Oh my gosh. So So is that what happens? I was always curious about that. Like you see these people getting sued for like X millions of dollars. It's like, they don't have that. What do you do? Just cl- declare bankruptcy and start over. And that yeah, person just gets it's, screwed. I, it's different for every person, but like, as a group, we like all decided that like, yo, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't want to waste my time and my energy going and appealing this when clearly this person does not have the money to pay us back the money that we're using to fight it. Right. You know, you've, you've sure. heard of ambulance chaser, right? There were people are patent chaser. There were people that would just go around and try and find little holes in the system. Oh my God, you fell down in the store. We're going to go. Yes. Yeah, store. yeah, yeah. We got to people on. are doing. That's what people are doing music now. That's insane. They have software that'll go 
just comb that 40,000 songs a day and find similar songs, wait for, wait for one of them to pop off, find the person that didn't pop off, call them and be like, yo, have you heard this song? This person took your song. And uh -huh. then they to a bunch of people that don't know anything about music or anything about anything. They just see one person that's successful and one person that's not. They feel bad for the person that's not. So they take money out of the person that is successful and give it to the person that's not. Yeah. That's it's crazy. Wild. Yeah, they do that with images too. I remember uh, the radio station I worked at when I'm, the last one I worked at before I just started doing the podcast full time. Uh, we got a, some season assist letter for uh, like an artist promo photo that was like on the website promoting like a concert they were doing. And it was like uh, the, you know, the management, and the label all sent this to the company to post that on the website to promote the show that was happening in San Diego. And then this lawyer probably was just has the same program that's just like sifting through stuff. And it's like, oh, did we give this guy, did they give us credit for this? And it's like, no, but your people did and they handed it to us. So like, and then that it was as simple as that, but it's just like the fact that that even came through was like, oh my gosh. It's crazy. The good news is, is that all this crap about NFTs and the blockchain and all that stuff that just kind of blew by and everybody throwing a bazillion dollars at Bitcoin, blah, blah, freaking out about their money. With the mechanisms that the things are being delivered with right now, in the upcoming years, you're going to be able to connect when you created something, how you created it, what it was, who shared things with you, how many other people created it. It's going to be all logged into the system. Mm -hmm. So if I make a song and I, and I go to put it on the blockchain, like in the future, you know, not, not today, but, but like in the future, you'll be able to say, oh, well, this song sounds 83% like this song. And you should reach out to these people and make sure, and you can compare data and compare analytics and say like, these are the people I made it with. And you can look back on your playlist and say, I've never heard your song. Uh, or you can, you know, like in the future, the same math that's causing all this turmoil is also causing a need for change. And that same math is going to be able to fix the problem. Not, not tomorrow, but. In, in yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've talked to a few artists that are doing that where they're putting their the records up on uh, our lady peace did it. Uh, uh, the new G love record where they'll put their songs up as NFTs, like the album, like you can yeah. buy it. And like, you then own a percentage of, the publishing i can't remember how they do it, it was just like yeah. really interesting like i said we're at, we're in a we're in a state of flux right now where there's like a a general melee of, of all kinds of different deliverables and mechanisms and you know nobody nobody in the world not one person not even the people who made it could have predicted that tiktok was going to be the number one music delivery system for for everybody you know what i mean like right five, you know, that like nobody thought that through period like mm -hmm. it was like you know so so yeah we, you know there's some things that are solid that are taking a long time to kind of develop but mm -hmm. in the middle of the things that are solid and long-term developments there's going to be a lot of miniature mechanisms and a lot of miniature changes that cause you know in the middle but yeah. i think at the end of the day you know it, it, it's going to pan itself out you know, especially now it's like they, the, the systems are so advanced about how, um, you know, they're analyzing music. I don't know if you are up on like DJ stuff, but like Serato, which is the, the main software that DJ yeah. just introduced something called Serato Stems, where I can play a Journey song and Serato will separate all of the parts. No way. The stems. It'll, it'll undo the song into stems. So if I just want to play the acapella, I could only have the mp3 for you know don't That's, stop believing yeah and, and, and through the software dj software i could just play the bass line if i wanted to with the song it's got to be just like oh my gosh that's crazy that's yeah, pretty cuckoo that is i mean that'll put a lot of people there's other companies that sell those packages right like they have yeah, they yeah, buy I mean, you, those you can you could do it stuff like that kind of through vsts but when i come consumer facing it changes the way people you know, it, it just, it's just extra tools to make, you know, people I mean, it's tools. awesome, it's but, like it's, yeah. it's, but, but those kind of things, when you could, when you leave it up to the human ear and the human heart to decide something as thorough as music, you know what I mean? Like there's always room for mistakes, you know what I mean? Like, and, right. and whatever. but, but music is just math. I mean, music is all, all math. It's all, 
all math, literally all of it. It's it's a, it's a it's a audible mathematical equation. It's that you know what I mean. So it's like when we use computers to dis disassemble that, then we can truly say like, yo, this is this, and this is this, and this is uh, how much this is, and it just you know, I think it's going to be a useful uh, useful tool in the future to have some of these things to backtrack and say like, all right, well, this might sound like Myron Gay, and it might not. And, and, and this is the appropriate amount that you should be paying for this. This is the general, this is a standard system. Do you want to pay that price before you put the record out? Do you, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? And yeah. not wait, not wait five years and then have them come back and ruin your whole career. Over <laughs> right. You know about, you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is so, uh, there's so many like, yeah. The, when it comes back to the, the fact that music is math, that even gets to another point where, I've seen these things where like it'll make the water make a certain have you seen that like what the the ripples like if you play certain oh, yeah. music and then you can figure out like it's almost like you can kind of curate like what might be you know a, not a hit but like something that would stimulate someone's ears to thinking like yeah, I, oh, I mean this I, is honestly I I think it was Boston that was a bunch of like MIT I might be speaking about this wrong but it was somebody but I think it was Boston who like uh, they were all MIT, like scientist level musicians that like literally sat down and tried to create like the perfect album mathematically. And, and they, by all account, they actually did it. It was like a number one album. And they, That's they, so they, crazy. They wrote the album based on mathematics and theory and like how, how people would respond to theory. Because That's... like, honestly, like the, the, the idea of a siren being annoying to you is simply based on like taking a sound wave is the, is the opposite of what happens in nature and and creating a sound wave that's abrasive to your ear when mm -hmm. you're a caveman and you're running around you're listening to these birds and bees that are all part of nature then you can feel it and you like it and you hear a rock you know blah, 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 coming down the hill and making all these square and and static weirdo sound waves it's like you it's a warning, right? It's like, a, mm -hmm. it's a warning. So when you, if you look at, if you look at a waveform for a siren, it's mm -hmm. visually ugly. Intense. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like visually. Yeah. And if you look at like, uh, if a sound bowl, like, you know, the things that like make. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They have like the sound the baths sound and stuff. Waves. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the sound waves, if you visually look at the sound waves, they, they're calm. I mean, uh -huh. it, it does this, you know what I mean? It's very, right smooth and so when you start having the connectivity of like okay i like looking at waves in the ocean it makes me calm i like listening to the trees it makes me calm oh shit let me look at the sound wave that makes that looks like this oh that actually makes me calm and this right. sound, the city makes me nervous like record the city and look at the sound wave it looks like somebody you know went like this on a piece yeah of it's just like you know? right yeah oh my god that's so, so like, crazy to think about that and like to even break it down like the way you just put it like that's like blows my mind that's so wild yeah the world isn't as complicated as people make it out to be right <laughs> really? know, that's what's scary about it right like if you can really break it down into just basically numbers it's in mathematics it's like oh my gosh well but I, uh, I think everybody everybody if you really really think about it everybody gets calm when it's calm and like those things all have similar traits right like they mm. all have similar traits smells visual cues sounds like right. nobody, nobody wants to sit and be calm in front of a siren sound or rammstein nobody wants nobody <laughs> right. to rammstein to be calm you know what like, I mean? oh yeah i'm gonna take a nap <laughs> put on like do <laughs> <laughs> oh man well th yeah this is, uh, thank you again so much paul for doing this i know i never i'm adam i didn't even introduce myself you know we're yeah, ha no half an hour in or whatever um but i'm curious so you are from chicago were you born and raised in chicago no detroit detroit okay yeah. born in but ohio. you're based in chicago i'm so born confused in, yeah no no born born in ohio okay, I, I remember you detroit. mentioned chicago yeah moved to detroit area when i was in sixth grade went to college in in michigan and then moved to chicago after college okay where in ohio were you did you grow up youngstown youngstown okay yeah, like where does that it's about 15 minutes from the Pennsylvania border. Okay. Yeah. I have family in like Cleveland area. That's what's curious. 
Yeah, so about 45 minutes uh, east of Cleveland. Yeah, nice. And then how old were you when you ended up moving? Sixth grade. You said you moved sixth grade, okay. Yeah. And what about music? How did you get into music? Um, the long story short is when I was in second grade, I got a tape called Mr. Magic's Rap Attack. Don't know how I got it. My uncle, my uncle, my dad's young, my dad's one of six or eight. I can't remember. My dad, okay. I think one of six kids. So my youngest uncle is only like 10 years older than me. Right. And in the in Ohio, my grandma was our next door neighbor, like a mile up the road. Oh, so, wow. so my so my grandma, my grandma and grandpa were farmers. And so like my 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 dad worked at the General Motors. That's why we ended up moving to Detroit. But my uh -huh. dad worked at this plant called Lordstown, which is close to Youngstown in Ohio. Anyway, my uncle was always playing music for me. Um, Van Halen and and Led Zeppelin and and like rock. My dad was always playing John Denver and like whatever. And and I got it in second grade. I remember very clearly being on a bus and having one of those walkman that you know like a walkman with like the big yeah over and and i don't know how i got this tape i don't know if my uncle gave it to me i don't know if i asked for it. i don't know what it was but it was called mr magic's rap attack then it had like houdini and grandmaster flash and like all these crazy hip-hop songs and i just went it, it was like a genesis like an awakening for me and like okay. on all i wanted to do was listen to hip-hop and hear hip-hop so i I, I just didn't, I didn't ask for toys or whatever, all, always records. Like I started collecting records when I was in second grade. That's so, wild. Oh my yeah, gosh. So, so, so um, yeah. And I didn't know that there was like, I never heard a real DJ because Mas Mr. Magic's Rap Attack wasn't a mixtape. It was just a bunch of songs that Mr. Magic, who was a radio DJ was playing in New York. And so, mm, yeah. I never really heard a real DJ play. And then I, but then I started like getting like heavy into like wanting to break dance and hearing break dance stuff and like getting VHS tapes of break dance things and watching like break in and beach street and all these things, blah, blah. So like, by, I entered like the third grade talent show as a, like a break dancer with like some, <laughs> that's amazing with, 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 uh, with two other dudes. And then, yeah, dude, I was just inundated in the culture and then when we moved to detroit because my dad got transferred there were djs on the radio and mm -hmm. then i was like this is this is what i want to do i want to do this and so like these like djs actually mixing DJ. on the radio yeah yeah like for his guy gary chandler was the guy's name gary chandler and the, the uh that was called the thunderstorm there were two djs the electrifying mojo who didn't mix and then gary chandler who did mix and and i was just dumbfounded like by what was happening i was just like it was like it was like seeing a, a fucking zebra mm -hmm. person for the real time the first time you know I mean? yeah is, so so yeah that's that's how it started wow and then did you uh what uh, get some turntable decks or like how did you kind of start uh so when i was a kid like you know when you can finally sneak out of your parents house i used to go to my buddy jim's house and we would yeah it, his parents didn't care if we left my parents cared deeply if we left but i used to go stay overnight at his house so we'd go to the city and in and, and Detroit and like so you know he quickly found out that like the hip-hop parties weren't like always the you weren't you didn't you didn't have 100% guarantee that you were coming home from the hip-hop parties without <laughs> right. so so like that there was techno was like kind of getting born and so we we just want to go to a party so we'd go to a techno party and we'd walk right in and like no problems nobody no nothing going on so anyway Techno was like super open vibes, friendly, you know, however you want to call it. Like it was just a very cool community. And it was kind of like the same thing. You go to, you get a flyer from 7-Eleven, you call a phone number from a pay phone. They tell you where the, where to go to get the address. You go get the address at a, a third location from a guy. And then the guy would give you the address. You go to an abandoned house that was like on the East side of Detroit that they were running electricity from a pole in. And like, it would be, they'd pay five bucks and they'd let you into this party. And nobody was Whoa. like, nobody was like um, drinking. I mean, they were probably, everybody was probably taking some sort of drugs then, but like, I, I didn't, it wasn't like a drinking environment. People were just dancing. Right. You know? 
and there were like people with throwing fire around and like with big boas on and then like wrapped in saran wrap and i just thought it was a magical land and so like when i but i still listened to hip-hop but i was going to these techno parties so i started listening to techno and it was kind of at the beginning of whatever but then when i went to go I, when I turned 16, I got a job at a car wash that was next to a record store because I couldn't get a job at the record store because nobody would let you get a job at a record store because it was a pretty close knit community. But I used to go right. every day. Then I'd go every day and then I started buying techno records and I bought a set of turntables when I turned, you know, 15 and got my first job. Um, there was shitty belt drive like linear. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you I was pull it back and it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying really hard to learn how to do it. And, um, you know, then, then, you know, cut, cut to the chase. Like I, I went to college, I took out a bunch of credit cards. I bought an MPC and I was sitting there trying to make hip hop and it came out as techno. Like I, wow. I just been in techno so much that I started making techno. So then I started making techno and submitting it. And from like 1993 or four, whatever it was to like 1995, I was just hammering techno, 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 techno. So I bought a bunch of keyboards and I was DJing and playing hip hop parties, playing techno parties, playing, all black parties and all white parties like the same exact shit everywhere it was like a really weird time like it for djs but like then djs weren't cool like you were you were, you were nobody gave a shit who was dj they just cared about the music so the music that was being played yeah. yeah so like i was pretty i was pretty much just like honed in on my craft and trying to be the best dj that i possibly could be and 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 play as many things as i possibly could but okay when doing hip hop parties in Detroit, techno parties in Detroit, and then hip hop parties in at school and techno parties at school. It's very. I was doing everything. I was working five nights a week, sometimes twice a night. Wow. And yeah. when did you start writing songs? So at this point, you're just what mixing records. No, I started. I was. I was. I've been producing records since I was since Cool Edit Pro. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, like Cool Edit Pro was the first software I bought. I had a Tascam DAT and a Roland. You know. Uh, keyboard and a 909 and and like whatever i was just hustling trying to do do make records yeah so what i was the like first record i put out was i was 19 the first record i put out but it, and it did really well so then i ended up playing in europe a lot for techno stuff yeah, i was gonna ask you okay so you, the first record you put out it, it like it went like it sold well like tell me about like how, how it got around back to people then, back then like you could put out a shitty record in detroit and just because it was from detroit it would do well in Europe because Detroit was like the Mecca of, of techno. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Detroit is all, all electronic music you've ever heard in your life that from Zed or Swedish house mafia or any of that, mm -hmm. that's all from Detroit. That's crazy. None of it's from anywhere else. So Detroit, like electronic music started two ways. Uh, let me back up. So before people knew what to call it, Yellow Magic Orchestra and Kraftwerk and all these German guys were using synthesizers to make music that wasn't necessarily qualifying as like real music. Again, right? Technology. But but these these you know four German guys, Kraftwerk, right? They they're making this records simultaneously in New York, like on the in the gay scene, like the Paradise Garage, uh, you know that kind of vibe. Larry Levon. Um, was DJing house music and they were trying to figure out, how, well, it wasn't called house music yet. They were DJing disco and they were trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to extend the disco breaks the same way that hip hop was trying to extend breaks like a little bit later on. They were using breaks in the record, extending songs that people could dance to more and playing this kind of vibe or whatever that was like popping off in the gay clubs. Mm -hmm. Those guys from New York were sh shifting with Chicago. So Chicago and New York, York were happening at the same time, but New York is obviously more of an advanced city. So the clubs were better and music was better, but dudes from Chicago were going to New York and back and forth and back and forth. So one of the main guys that played underneath Larry LeVon ended up going back to Chicago and DJing at a club called The Warehouse. And so people were taking drum machines at that point in Chicago and putting drum machines under disco and playing it at The Warehouse. And that's why they call it house music. House music oh, was in wow. the warehouse in Chicago. And that was born out of the disco stuff in the gay clubs in New York that took it back to Chicago. Simultaneously, Kraftwerk, this DJ called the Electrifying Mojo, who was completely amazing in retrospect, was playing all this avant-garde music in Detroit to the kids listening to the radio. And so all these hip hop kids and R&B kids 
in Detroit were listening to craft work when they were growing up in that 10, 10 year old range. And so they were using synthesizers trying to emulate craft work, but, but, but their parents were listening to R and B, you know what I mean? So you got these R and B influences and this craft work influence and these drum machines that were coming out all at the same time. And so these kids, uh, you know, Kevin Saunderson, Derek May, uh, you know, making these records that were part craft work, part R&B, all drum machine, very minimal, and people were dancing to them. So in Detroit, wow. you have techno being born. The same time as in Chicago, you have house being born. So all techno and all house music worldwide comes from Detroit or Chicago. That's so interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, obviously you're in the midst of all that when it was happening. Yeah, I mean, like, like, like techno was probably like if you ask like Anthony Shakur and like th- there was a record that came out that got released in London that like people widely regard as like the first big step into techno. And I think it was called Techno, the New Sound of Detroit. You got to fact check me on this, but like okay. there's like Anthony Shakur and a bunch of other records that like a bunch of other records that were kind of popping off in Detroit and they started put it out on a London label. And then from there, it like spread like wildfire. And then wow. in a, in a, in a circular motion, Germany picked back up because Germany had been used to listening to craft work and all that stuff. Germany were like the first people to adopt techno and its new iteration. So like Germany is, is both kind of the Genesis part, not the birthplace, but like the fetal, you know, the fetal mm-hmm. place of it. Techno is the birth, place in detroit and then it kind of goes back to germany to to re-sprout again so like a lot of the big labels trezor um international dj gigolos uh-huh. all those record labels are all german labels that like kind of refed the machine that's wow that yeah i had no idea about that that's, that's i'll draw crazy. you up a whole map of it <laughs> <laughs> um wow okay so you were doing that you're de- so this allows you to to DJ, what, full-time at this point? You're going to Europe, and this is your gig at this point now. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I was going to school to, to grad. I graduated with, like, an education degree, but I was... I you were learning, like, Japanese, right? And I you speak Japanese? Japanese. Yeah. In high school for a year, and then, but, like, I was making more in a week DJing than I was making in a whole year teaching high school. That's crazy. So, obviously, I was like, I'm going to try and run with this for a minute. Mm-hmm. And then what, like, obviously you have, you've done a lot of work with Lady Gaga and that, that came what later down the line, like, had you been doing other things in, in between, obviously you were doing other things, but like, what was kind of like the next progression up until up to that point? I, I, I use the colloquialism, a long story short, uh, a lot. I say that a lot just by whatever, because I feel like I could talk about it for like forever and ever, because there's so many like intricacies that happen in the middle. Well, I'm sure. Of it. Yeah. But when I was 23, I had this like five year career of like producing records and making records and DJing and getting paid and traveling. And then like some stuff happened in Detroit where like techno kind of turned into something that like trance. And I wasn't really into trance because it kind of was like more about drugs and less about like soul kind of thing. So mm-hmm. like, I kind of made a decision to stay, took my money from DJ and I opened up my own club. I was running my own club because I thought I was too old to play records anymore. That morphed into me like being a club owner for the next whatever, eight years. Would, would you then and, what book book other DJs to come in and, and yeah, and I did cool. myself. I had like a little house club and a little little hip hop club and, and I liked it very much. It was really fun. Um, but like my passion was like making stuff and actually right. It just was like, I just thought I was too old. I thought I literally thought I was too old to keep DJing. So I thought I got to make something that's going to be like a profession because right. in my mind often in life, the only thing that you're battling is yourself. Like I was literally in a full battle with myself because everybody was like, you're never going to do this. Like, why are you doing this? And there was no, there was no Zed at that point. Like, you right. Know, right. Nobody looked I mean, at it. yeah. I mean, mainstream uh, electric uh, i mean edm and stuff didn't even really hit until no like when i started noticing it was I, I was on the radio in san diego for a long time and then i ended up getting a job in san francisco and it wasn't until i moved to san francisco in like 2000 i don't know maybe it was 2010 or so yeah. like that's when i feel like avici was coming and yeah. like they had you know, like more of those bigger records started skrillex kind of did something yeah. and it was like 
that's when it really for me that's when it really broke through mainstream yeah it started ripping then because you know bands were falling off and 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 like well bands weren't falling off like in in the in the mid 90s and like to the blink 182 let's just take blink 182 and green day yeah if I can fill up a stadium with one dude in a video screen right i can fill <laughs> yeah. up Madison square garden with one dude in a video screen uh i'm gonna do that before i fly in a whole stage rig and oh right guys their personalities and the whole band behind mm-hmm. them and all the rigging and like that it's all it was a commodity thing oh my god this guy is selling this many records let's take him and package him because it's a lot we we're going to make a lot more money it had nothing to do with the music like no at, at the end of the day what you get and what you don't get rarely has to do with the music it's it, it who's guys. behind it's it commodity. Come yeah, on. right, right. right. That's so, yeah, so at that so point, interesting. That, the, the, it was growing so big underground, you know, same way disco did, dude. Disco, mm-hmm. if you look at disco and you look at EDM, they're exactly the same trajectory. Bunch of gay guys sitting around playing music in a club, having a good time. It's soulful, it's pure, it's amazing. People dancing and having fun and enjoying themselves. Mm-hmm. Then it becoming a bunch of straight guys coming in and li- <laughs> liking it. And then it becoming a phenomenon underground. And then a bunch of really, really straight guys <laughs> saying, We're, how do we make money off of this? Right, and then yeah, exactly. <laughs> making it a commodity to the point that it's so overexposed that in the 70s, Kiss was making a disco album. And in the late, you know, in the 2010s, Usher's at Coachella with a leather vest on. You know what I mean? It's the same exact it's the same exact thing it, it, like if you step back and actually look at it for what it is it's like it's the same pattern over and over and again and i'll tell you the people that master the music business like max martin uh-huh. are, are are they're not virtuosos with music they're great pattern recognizers and reproducers right the same yeah. it happens all the time dude it's literally like the same exact thing happens over and over and over and over again so the people that are good at at like longevity are good because they're great pattern recognizers. They know when the next thing's coming up. And they're good That's, musicians. Too. I'm not saying Max Martin's not a good musician. Right. He's a terrible musician. I know, but, but he's, he's also pattern. like you said, like yeah, but he's recognizing patterns and he's able to write the like yeah. At one point, pretty much every hit song that you heard was like yeah. <laughs> was yeah. him, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes. and a lot, a lot of times they're Swedish because of ABBA, but that's a whole different story. We can talk about that. That's a different trajectory. But yeah. yeah, wow. <laughs> okay, so that was happening. You own this club, um, and do you? So, like, from that point, do, do you like does the club? Do you, do you continue with the club? Like, how does that? What's the next kind of jump in your life? I, I sold it. I sold the club, um, and I, I I had enough money that I could go back to having fun again. I didn't have to worry about stuff for a minute. Mm-hmm. So then I just started making tracks again. I started DJing again. I was out playing and and in the mix again and confident and comfortable because I had a little bit of dough. And um, yeah, I was submitting records like a madman and and playing as much as I could and just make connections. And I submitted some records to a couple of people, ended up doing some remixes for Estelle and shit, I don't even remember who else at this point, but like, um, I know Estelle was a big one because she just done American Boy and I did a remix for another song she had. It was like an Atlantic Records thing. And Were those kind of the early like big gets like, oh, wow. And that, did that kind of get your name on the, you know, the radar all, for other major micro, acts? Whatever. It's all micro stuff, you know, like you're, you're submitting, submitting, submitting. And then, you know, they say like, you know, luck is like preparedness and, and whatever that colloquial yeah. is. It's it, we were preparedness and whatever. Prepared and we're, yeah, being in the right place, basically. Place, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> but being uh, prepared when you're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, it was kind of that, right? Like you're, you're yeah. trying stuff, trying stuff, trying stuff, sending stuff, sending stuff, sending stuff. And you're building up this buzz like underneath so that when one thing happens and you're there to put your fist down, everybody back here remembers like that you've been doing it for a minute, right? Yeah. So sometimes when you're working, you're not getting a result. You really are getting a result because you're built, you're building kinetic energy that like once you flip the switch on one thing all the other stuff kind of comes up to the top right Mm -hmm. so it was it wasn't like you know it wasn't like a series it wasn't like a i mean there's always a catalyst one catalyst two catalyst three catalyst but like at the end of the day it's not it's not ever just one thing 
one thing can't carry you ever. You got to keep right. working, 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 even though it might appear, especially like in today's world where it's like, oh shit, this guy made a really great investment and it just took off and look at how cool he is on a boat. I guarantee you that guy made 800 shitty investments to make the one investment. And if he didn't, the one investment that panned off is going to go away really quickly because you got to make a million mistakes. You got to do a million things. Behind yeah. It, the one it's kind of like that, those in the song world, like as somebody that will just puts th throw a song up that maybe is the first one they've ever done or like just something that they've created. And then like TikTok just takes it and it's like, you know, then getting all these downloads and then it's like, can they follow that up if they've never done anything else? Yeah, right. Exactly. Cause like th that, that's, that's literally like the difference between winning and losing is how much failure you've had like to to back up the win right it's like i love it, that i've never heard that said yeah, before like you've got to make a shit ton of mistakes and and like get your head right if, if i just walk if i walked up to a dude who was making 20 dollars an hour right now and gave him a million dollars chances are he's not going to know how what to do with the million dollars Right. It'll be you know gone I mean? in yeah, six months. <laughs> yeah, chances are, I mean, not always, but chances are right. Somebody who's made a million dollars and lost a million dollars when they get the next million dollars is definitely going to get to know what to do with a million dollars the second time. You know right. I mean? Right. So it's just, it's one of those things. You know who to submit stuff to, know who to talk to. You try a trial and error for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. the difference between what I was doing, when I was 18. What I did when I was 18 and that time in between really prepared me to do a lot of things right the second the second time around so like when mm -hmm. i got up 31 you know i had lived a, a whole different career right cycle, right exactly yeah uh, i'd done business i knew what lawyers were i knew how to talk to people i'd written contracts then i'd gone and met a bunch of people i've dj'd in clubs from la to new york i've played overseas so it wasn't like if I, if I would have got with Guy when I was 18, like we would have, pro I probably would have made it three songs in and fucking fall apart. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, you at least you have the experience and like you get to take that with you. Right. I mean, you've, you know, if you're 18 and she's like, oh my gosh. And then you, you know, you do three things and you're out because you don't yeah. understand the, what's really, like you said, you just said it beautifully. I'm trying to repeat you, but I, no, no, right no. I mean, <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a life fact. And I, listen, I, I made plenty of mistakes the second time around too. I'm, 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 on, I'm on my third swing now, you know what I mean? So hopefully you just don't stop swinging. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you meet her at 31 and, but at this point, did she have a, a big record out yet? Cause didn't you help her on the first album? She literally was on our first big tour. She was on our first ar arena tour. Okay. So like she, so she, had, she had popped even started off a bit. Arena. She hadn't even started her first arena tour when we met. So she was still playing at like House of Blues when we met. So she had she had gone past club to House of Blues land, and she was just starting to combine. Strangely enough, um, she was supposed to go on tour with Kanye West. They were trying to use Kanye to bring her up into a sphere, and they were doing a dual tour together, and 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 they were agreed to do it. And then Kanye shit on Taylor Swift. At oh, the, at the the at the VMAs or whatever. Yeah, uh, VMAs. And then um, and then it simultaneously her song started getting really big, and they just made a decision to take Kanye West off tour and let her have her own tour. Oh wow! Oh, cause yeah, she had fame out at that point, right? Yeah, it was it was out, and it was yeah, doing, it, it was. So it was that's yeah, I was gonna say longer. that's when it's she like that's when for her it went like from yeah probably House of Blues to yeah, Staples Center. <laughs> I don't know if it went that big, but so her, her her manager at the time, who's now the head creative at Givenchy, Matt Williams, um saw me DJing in a club and I was playing hip hop and house music at the same time in LA, which wasn't happening at, the, uh -huh. at that time in LA. It was mashups like, you know, Oh yeah. That was big for a while, but I wasn't doing that. I was playing, I was playing house music and in an old hip hop. So I wasn't mashing up. I was, I was waving it. You know what I mean? Like, his yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, which was like pretty strange at the time. So this dude saw me and he was like, I got this tour. We're trying to program the music for it. We need a good transition between hip hop and, and dance and hip hop and dance and hip hop and dance. Could you submit some music for it? And I did. He didn't tell me who it was. I didn't find out that it was Kanye and Gaga until after I had already submitted the music. 
Whoa. So I submitted the music. They, they ended up telling me what it was. Then they ended up telling me they couldn't pay me because the label had already paid somebody else to do it that failed. They didn't have a budget for it. She was already over budget for the show and asked me if I mind doing it for free. So I did it for free. Then they dropped Kanye. So then I readjusted again just to do for her. And I did it all. And I didn't ask anything. And Matt, to Matt's credit, Matt's still an amazing guy. We talk every once in a while. He's a great person. Um, <laughs> Matt went on to work with Kanye after the Gaga thing, which is crazy. But long story short, again, um, Matt was like, when she starts working on another album, I'm calling you first. Thanks for all the work, blah, blah, which you hear all the time in LA. Mm. People fuck you and they never call yeah, you. Yeah, and then you're like, oh yeah, sure you will. But but the lovely Matt Williams called me again. It was, it was like, she's working on another album, send me some tracks. And I, and, I, and I stayed up for two weeks straight, bam, 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 tracks, sent them to her. And three days later, she called me. And six months after that, we ended up starting on Born This Way. Wow. Yeah. And you wrote, you, you wrote that song with her, Born This yeah. Way? Yeah, uh, I wrote, I think, uh, you know, 80, 70 to 80 percent of that Born This Way album. album. Whoa, yeah. that's incredible. Yep. So we were on tour for two years on that, finished that record, got right into art pop after that in like 2013, finished that record in 2015. She went and did Joanne. <clears throat> I, at that time, I just was burnt out. So and that, that record, I didn't really think I could help on. And then we went into Stars Born, um, which we just finished in 2000. That's, yeah, and you worked on that one too. You got a Grammy for that one. Yeah, yep. And then- That's um, so cool, man. And then since then, just, you know, trying to figure out what's next. Didn't you, you, did I read that you're working on another record? Are you working on her new, does she have a new record that you're working on or something? No, no, she's, oh. she, she's doing uh she's doing that Joker movie now and, and- uh, Oh yeah, 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 I forgot about that. She, she just did it out. She just did a record with a couple other dudes. Some of the guys that I, you know, introduced her to initially, well, mostly all the guys I introduced her to, you know, whatever did Chromatica, but I just yeah. wasn't able to do it at the time. And then, um, yeah, I'm doing some soundtrack stuff and some other artists and I get to kind of, you know, after a while, you could be the biggest hamburger lover in the world, but if somebody sticks you behind a, 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 a grill at Burger King for 15 years, you're not going to want to eat hamburgers as much as you did, you know? Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, totally, well, totally, yeah, totally. So, so I've been spacing out my hamburger eating a lot more than I was, you know, 10 years ago. And yeah. Um, you know weird. i love your uh, uh like i was listening to the three eps that you put out or like that trilogy of music that you yeah. put out yeah um and then i was watching like but right before i got on the call with you i watched um the music video couple of music videos like for fear and uh what other one did i watch that was like it like blew my mind the clock what's it oh, called yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. yeah. it's crazy oh, my, that was like one of the craziest music videos like I've I've ever you know, nobody, nobody paid attention seen. to any of that because I didn't I didn't force it down anybody's throats I didn't ask for any help or like put like, it out like I didn't even know how, like, you know, the clock uh the clock is ticking so yeah. I'm watching like the first one I watched is like oh this is this is rad like the edits are so rad like do you yeah. edit it or do you have somebody that so yeah one of my I, I literally like didn't know how to do any of that stuff and so like I started doing it and I and a buddy of mine was like oh let me help you with that and so we did it together um, okay. Like, back in back in the day but like it's i always work with my whenever i'm making anything i i watching something and so i just wanted to combine the two and i never really wanted to be a forward-facing artist but i had made all that stuff and i thought and i thought it was cool and i showed it to somebody one day and they were like you should put this out and i was like go ahead do whatever you want with it so they just put okay. it out it wasn't something i ever considered to like make a career out of but like now that i watch it back i'm i'm pretty proud of it it's cool stuff. oh yeah yeah fear one was wild i mean just the footage that you kind of used which was all canned it looked, i mean from other things right it was like stock footage yeah. but the video you put together for the clock is ticking like yeah. oh like the edits just everything about it man i was like the build up through the first half I, like i thought it was over in the first half you know there's yeah, like yeah. two scenes yeah. so i thought i'm like okay it's over and that was cool. Like how you have like, you know, the, you know, the egg and then the yeah, baby yeah, yeah. and then the parents waiting for, you know, like all yeah, we, of it, we, like, I didn't really know what I was doing with that, but like I, I made the track and then, and then like I, I started working on the video and then I went back and remade the track after I kind of found that footage and purchased the footage. And like, so it kind of happened oh. simultaneously. So it was like okay. kind of like half, 
here's this cool track. And then it was like, oh shit, I can make a score to something that I've started to think of. So it was like kind of like an interwoven score slash track thing. Yeah, because in the beginning it was like, I mean, it's it's cool, but it's kind of like sad. You're like, wow, like life goes so fast. Yeah. And you're like, you know, the kid graduating and then their kids graduating and he's looking in the mirror and he's got the medicine. And I was like, oh, this is kind of like, now I'm thinking of my kids. I'm like, wow, like life goes so fast. And then the next piece of that, when it comes back around the second time, you're just like, whoa, like, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, and just like the video ends. And I was like, having like a panic attack. Like, I like, <laughs> what's going on with you? I'm like, shit, like I've, I've got to talk to him in like five minutes. And I'm like, my mind is just like reeling off what I just witnessed. <laughs> well, you know, the, the whole point of that video and the whole point of like you know I, i'm a person i think that toils with like disaster and beauty all kind of on the same line right like it's like the, all all genius and insanity and like you know the idea that people could be dichotomous and like have sort of like great feelings and terrible feelings all at the same time and like you know when i was making that i was like yo the the overarching theme for me is that like you can do one one thing and it'll fuck shit up for a year. So don't do oh, one yeah. thing that's so bad that it'll fuck shit up forever. You know what I mean? Like you can make a series of choices that like lead down a really bad path that you got to pull yourself out of kind of vibe. And it's uh-huh. like this guy in the, in the the subject of the video at the beginning was like, hey, yes, life is fast. The clock is going by. Make make note like of like what you love and what you don't do more of what you love and less of what you don't that kind of vibe you know what i mean yeah. like before you know it, you're going to be in in a hole i mean then when i was making it i've kind of find this simultaneous footage where it's like it's like uh as you're doing this even even though the end is always the same the end's always the same bro you're always born you always die right yeah right but at any moment you can make a bad decision. You need to be hyper aware of the decisions that you're making while you're making some something as small as having road rage or or having one too many drinks can really put you in a spot where you it's hard to get back on the right track. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's like you know I kind of like just wanted to make a visual audible res- representation of that kind of like you know the the bad isn't so. When, when when things are bad, good isn't so far away. And when things are good, bad isn't so far away. Does that right? Make sense? Yeah, no, it did. I mean, it was brilliantly done. I was like, I mean, I've I've uh I'm in recovery and I've and I just like watching, like I never, you know, I wasn't there, like there's the point with a girl and like the this yeah. assault like that wasn't me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> like just I want to straight up say that. Yeah, but there's yeah. pieces of it where like he, you know, in the beginning, he's blowing the joint, like, like onto the, you know, holding it. I'm like, like that just re- like had visual, like, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I remember doing that. And then like, he bar, like he pukes a few times. He's just yeah. kind of stumbling around. Like I did, like it put me back in that mindset. I was like, holy shit. I was like out of control for a while. But yeah. then I saw those other things that made me way uncomfortable. And I'm like, okay, like at least I'd, again, what you were saying, like you could do one thing that could turn your life a certain way. And then there's a totally other, you could take it another step. Right. And so I'm like, oh shit. Like I didn't, I'm glad I didn't take it. I mean, my mind never did that step of it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so here's the thing you get to the first part and you're like, oh shit, this guy dies. It's sad. And then you get to the second part and you're like, oh shit, this guy also died. It ends the exact same way, but yeah, God, that's not, I don't want to die like that. Yeah. (laughs) Like it was really like eye opening. Yeah, dude. So anyway, congratulations on your recovery, by the way. That's great. Oh no. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. When, when just like the, when he's beating the shit out of the guy with like the key in his hand, like I was just like, <laughs> like, I didn't crazy. Hey, not, not to switch uh, shots on you, but um, Kim, I have to wrap up pretty quick. I got to get oh. out of here. Um, oh no, 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 no. Sorry. Yeah. I took way no, too okay. much of your time. No, no, no. It's all good. Let, let get, give me, you got anything else that we want to go over? That's like really like super duper important. I got, I got yeah, like I, four or five more minutes. Yeah. I just have one more quick question actually. Sure. Um, I want, and you kind of answered it earlier. I was just wondering if you had any uh, advice for aspiring artists. Oh man, you know, I, the one thing I can say that's like a universal truth is like I was kind of talking about earlier. Like most of the time, your worst enemy is yourself, right? And it's it's like pre-programmed yourself. The world is full of beauty and greatness and like opportunity and um 
being self-aware um, and and pursuing what you want um, relentlessly is is always the key to success, right? Like you you're gonna tell yourself no um, more than other people are gonna tell you no. Sometimes you feel like people are telling you no, but like if if you're telling yourself yes all the time, even when somebody says no to you, you know I don't like that phrase. Don't take no for an answer. Like mm-hmm. take no for an answer from other people. Who gives a shit what other people say? Like keep doing, you know what I mean? Like but for yourself, don't don't tell yourself no ever. You know what I mean? Like there's periods of self-doubt and worthiness and like whatever. If you're self-aware and you know what you want, you got to be able to face like some sort of rejection from other people, but don't try your heart, try your hardest not to face it from yourself. Don't, don't let yourself tell yourself no. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that to me has been like the biggest like key. Try not to get in your own head about like what you're doing. Um, trust yourself. Know that anything's possible and that if you get knocked over a couple of times, you just got to dust yourself off and don't, don't stop believing in yourself. Bring me the bad word.